Support for this podcast comes from our Indiegogo campaign, our friends and family campaign, the That's What Credit Cards Are For Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you. We're going to help a lot of folks by playing games and telling jokes. We'll do some good while having fun. And broadly speaking, it's a pun. Get it? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome to the stage your hosts, Analea Arnold and Kate Lure. I'm Kate Lohr. And I'm Analea Arnold. And this is our broadband, the Strip Mall Debutantes. <laughs> Welcome to Broadly Speaking Episode 2, Broadly Art Speaking Lear. <laughs> this is a show where we tell some jokes, tell some stories, and play a game the contestant is destined to lose. All to help someone who's helping someone else. Tonight, that someone is Rocky Turner, founder of Mothers Fighting for Others, an organization that helps orphaned and vulnerable girls in Nairobi by providing them with a loving home and a quality education. And while we think what Rocky is doing is extraordinary, she would say that she's just trying to give her girls the same things ordinary kids have. Because children can inspire people to go to some pretty great lengths. They sure can. For example, stuntman Nicholas Sook decided to lock himself in a small glass room with over 300 venomous spiders to raise some funds for his favorite children's charity. Hopefully a charity that educates children on the dangers of various spider species and the importance of good health insurance. <laughs> and Jacob French raised almost $100,000 for his favorite children's charity by walking across the entire continent of Australia, clad head to toe in a stormtrooper outfit. <laughs> the, for <laughs> the force is strong in that one. I hope the deodorant is too. <laughs> and Kate and I decided to put together this show. Which involves neither poison nor exercise. You're welcome. <laughs> and parents of all stripes all over the world fight the good fight every day to help their little ones grow up healthy and strong. And sometimes getting through the day with your kids all in one piece can be pretty tricky. Our first performer knows all about how tricky parenting can be. She's the comedian, author, and editor of the book Afterbirth, Stories You Won't Read in Parents Magazine, <laughs> which the New York Post called the vagina monologues for the stroller set. <laughs> I would have called it the fresh out of the vagina monologues, but that's just one of many reasons I don't write for the New York Post. So <laughs> please welcome to the stage, Miss Danny Klein Modisette. <laughs> A mic. One. How Thank exciting you. is this? How about a hand for these ladies? Yeah. Yeah. That's exciting. Thank you. Mothers fighting for others. I'm just so happy they're not fighting with me. I, uh, I have to say the transition from uh, comedian to mother, you know, it just hasn't been smooth for me. Uh, this, apparently women with little children, they don't like being treated like hecklers. <laughs> Fuck them. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. That was where we're, this is all women. I'm gonna swear at all of you all night. Oh no, there's a man here, okay. Uh, thank God, I'm so inspired. I was so inspired all day about this show that um, I actually decided not to have my hair blown out. <laughs> thank you. And to give the money to charity. I'm taking that 40 bucks and I said, I am just gonna give it to the mothers fighting for others and you people will just have to deal with the frizz. So I'm pretty excited about that, yeah. Yeah, I also, I didn't, I didn't work out inspired because how can I run for fun? I'm running for fun. People are running for safety. You know what I'm saying? I'm not just gonna run like it's fun. So that was out for the day. Absolutely not working out, yeah. And then I didn't put on very much makeup because you know, I really wanna be in solidarity with the thousands and thousands of dollars that people have spent on laser eye surgery to get infections in their eyes, like me. Anyone? No, that's just me, because I'm in that 1%. You know that 1%? Not the elite economic 1%, just in case you were concerned. No, I'm in that 1% that gets every fucking side effect of anything that could ever happen to anyone. That's the 1% that I'm in, and uh, so that's, that's the happy note that I'll say. So, so, mothers fighting for others. I would like to say that I wish that I could be as generous as Rocky. You're gonna meet her later. 
She's so inspiring, it's nuts. With the song, really, she just play while she talks. Da da da, da da da. She's amazing. Um, I am not that generous. I, uh, I also, I don't, I really need a lot of focus for my own children, as you're about to see. I mean, most of the time, they're safe. Uh, tonight, I, I'm sure they're fine. They're with a sitter, so that's how I know they're safe, because I'm here. Okay, so, um, <laughs> okay, but don't be frightened. A long, long time ago, and I can still remember how the music used to make me smile. Todd, my husband, was putting our two boys to bed, proving his love for them by singing one of his least favorite songs, that epic American Pie. I had just returned from New York after visiting my mother, so naturally I was in the kitchen foraging for treats, trying to take the edge off my feelings about having a mother who's losing her mind to Alzheimer's. I do the food shopping, and yet I still hunt for treats in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, like there's some treat elf who, who comes up through the disposal with a satchel of tasty morsels when I'm not looking. <laughs> on good days, I grab some tea and call it a night, but on bad days, I can polish off a box of cereal with my hands. <laughs> or anything that comes in a clear plastic container, especially if it's chocolate covered. This was not a good day. I was jet lagged, and since I had six and a half hours to consult WebMD on the flight, I was intimately familiar with the hereditary statistics for Alzheimer's and calculating how many hours of sanity I had left. <laughs> That's when I saw the shiny brown balls, chocolate covered coffee beans. Yes. I took down the clear plastic container of caffeine speed balls. I looked at the clock, 8.45. Just one handful, that's it. I'll send some emails and try to laugh during the Goldbergs one more time. I popped three of them in my mouth, licked some chocolate off my lips, and stared at the box. I listened for Todd's voice, calculating how much time I had until the last chorus. A lot. I could eat more without him walking in on me, like they are my secret lover. <laughs> because they are. <laughs> I sneak food from my own house like a teenager, exactly like I did in my parents' house when I was a teenager. I savor the bittersweet taste. These won't affect me tonight, I think, with the jet lag. They'll, they'll probably just level me out. I scrape the bottom of the box. <laughs> Half an hour later, I pass Todd in the hallway on his way to bed. I am wearing running gear <laughs> because I am going running. Uh, keyed up from the trip, he asks. Yep, I say, passing my fingers across my lips to make sure they aren't caked with brown crumbs, like Lindsay Lohan wiping her nose coming out of the bathroom. I run three miles on the treadmill and then catch up on TV. I panic a little when I can't remember the name of that hot Indian chick on The Good Wife because that's probably how it started for my mother, I think, not being able to remember the names of TV characters. I can still feel my heart beating in my chest when my head hits the pillow at 4 a.m. Then my scalp starts itching. Again, it started in New York. I thought it was bed bugs since I heard they were taking over the city, but no one else in my family complained. Then I thought it was stress, but then, then I remembered that I had my hair dyed with organic dye before I left, which sounds great in theory, but apparently those chemicals are there for a reason because I was clearly having some kind of reaction to the sunflower extracts and antioxidants or whatever. Back in LA, desperate to get some rest, I finally itched myself to sleep. Two and a half hours later, the alarm rings. I make the boys lunches, kiss them goodbye, and write checks to all the people I hired back in New York that my mother will fire a week later. I make an espresso, back in the saddle. By mid-afternoon, I'm crashing, and my scalp is driving me nuts. I need to call that salon, but I can't remember the name. I strip off my pajamas, throw on a t-shirt and jeans, and head to the boys' bus stop at the corner of Crack and Freeway in Hollywood. <laughs> With my brawlessness, bloodshot eyes, and scratchy head, I feel right at home. Mommy needs a quick nap, I tell them an hour later after art class, so you can watch your 30 minutes of TV before homework tonight. I'm forcing my eyelids to stay open, which is not easy when you're stuck in traffic at twilight. No problem, Gabriel says. No problem, Gideon echoes. We pull into the garage. The keys, the keys, Mom, Gabriel yells at me. He loves racing ahead to open the door now. I usually don't let him, but I think, you're exhausted, just let him do it. I grab groceries out of the trunk, the thought of my sweet, soft pillowcase almost moves me to tears. As soon as I open the back door to the house, 
I hear the crash. I drop the bags and run toward it. What the fuck, I say, before I have time to edit myself. I stop cold in the living room. Glass shards are everywhere. The TV cabinet has a cartoon-like hole in it with spiked edges where a panel used to be. What the fuck, I yell. I look around for Gabriel and find him behind me, crying and screaming. Mom, Mom, I'm sorry, he yells. Gabriel, I say, seeing his sock feet, knowing how much he loves to slide on the hardwood floor. What the fuck, I yell again, hating myself for having, letting, having let him run in ahead of me, hating kids TV that gets him so excited he does dumb shit, furious at him for being a boy, and at me for binging on those coffee beans and feeling so hungover, until he lifts his hand off his leg. And there is blood everywhere. And the flesh of his knee is sliced open like the fillet of an animal. Holy shit. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Fuck, 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 fuck. I do not swear in front of the children as a rule, but who gives a shit about rules when there's real blood and it's one of theirs? I start running in circles, trying to figure out what to do. It's okay. It's okay, Gabriel. It's going to be okay, I say. I notice Gideon in the corner of the dining room is also crying. Gideon, it's going to be okay, sweetie. It's going to be okay, I yell out to him. But really, I have no idea what to do. I cut every first aid class I ever had. No wonder I never got cast as a nurse when I was an actress. Who would believe me? <laughs> I call Todd. Well, uh, the first thing you need to do is calm down and stop the flow of blood. <laughs> I hang up on him. I don't need that kind of fucking patronizing tone. But the stopping the blood was a very good suggestion. I remember some details from a sixth grade health class because my long-term memory, like my mother's, is fine. I run to the kitchen and get a rag. I almost throw up thinking about the phrase, stop the flow of blood. All that stuff about me being good in a crisis, I always tell people, this is a pile of shit. <laughs> Gabriel sniffles on the floor as I hold a rag to his leg. We're both breathing more normally now. Then I remember Gideon simpering in the corner of the dining room. Gideon, honey, come here. It's fine. He's fine. He starts to walk toward us until I notice his bare feet and the glass shards spread on the floor before him like sprinkles on a donut. Stop, I scream, re-scaring the shit out of him. I tiptoe over and pick up. You're fine. You're fine, honey. You're fine. I just didn't want you to step on the glass. I hold him close. I'll pull the car out in front of the house. That'll be easy for you, Gabriel. Gideon, get a pair of shoes from your room. Racing around the house looking for my keys, it occurs to me that our neighbor is a nurse. What's his name? I can't remember his name. I'm, I'm going next door anywhere. Anyway, the heels of my boots tick tick on the sidewalk because it has started to rain. His wife answers the door. Hi. I say, intentionally swallowing her name because it's either Veronica or Vanessa. I'm never sure which. It's Gabriel, my son. Please, he fell. Jose, Danny Mata said is here. Hay una problema con su hijo. Of course she knows my name. She's like 30. <laughs> Jose comes out. I try not to cry. They exchange a few words in Spanish, and for a minute I feel like we're in a Garcia Lorca play. Jose races back to the house with me, and as soon as he walks in, there is calm. Well, not for me, but the boys are feeling better. Is, is he all right? I stammer. Can you feel this? Jose asks Gabriel, pressing around his knee. Yes. There's no nerve damage, but he'll need some stitches. He asked me for a bandage, which Gabriel is certain we have, but I can't think where I lost saw it. Maybe I'm not in line for Alzheimer's. Maybe I'm just a terrible housekeeper. I find the bandage. We get him wrapped up, and Jose carries him to the car, dusted with water from the rain. Todd joins us at the hospital. He found us with his Find My app, Find My Phone app he got, and then put it into my phone, too. It's much harder for me to run away from him now. Two hours and eight stitches later, the knee is wrapped up, Gabriel gets a new pair of crutches, and we head home. I tuck him into bed, kissing him on his sweet head, just in time to start to feel mine itch again. The phone rings, it's my mother, and I head to the kitchen, hoping the elves have made a surprise visit. One more time for Danny Klein Modestine. A 
According to our next performer, in 1998, she asked her Russian immigrant parents if they were copacetic with her desires to become a stand-up comedian. And they replied, well, it's not like you're smart enough to be a doctor. <laughs> she took that as their blessing to pursue her dreams and has never looked back. You've seen her everywhere. Funny people get invited to be seen. Please welcome to the stage, Ms. Kira Zoltanovich. <laughs> Yeah. I'll that, take this from that's, you. That's, that song is so nailing it right now. I do need to let it go. And I can't. Hey, everybody. I'm also a mother and helping other mothers who are helping others who are mothers. So I just want to... Did I get it right? Am I... Every, right? That's it, right? That's what we're doing? We're others helping others who are mothers, who, right? Who are, have mothers. Do you have mothers? I'm helping your mother. I am a mother too. I just, none of us on stage can keep our legs closed, right? Uh, I have a three-year-old, um, so that means my husband and I created a very expensive alarm clock. <laughs> You never wake up on your own when you have a three-year-old, ever. Do you understand? I don't think you understand because you, no, you rolled out of bed, mm, 12.30, boo, no. 6 a.m. and you're always woken up by someone screaming or yelling or you're getting hit in the head with something or something sticky in your eye and not in the good way, ma'am. It's <laughs> always aggressive. Six o'clock in the morning, my three-year-old is down the hallway in his room yelling, Mommy! That's how he wakes me up in the morning. Like he's athletic heckling me. <laughs> Easy out! <laughs> Easy out! So I go down to his room and I say, hey, it's still dark. Go back to sleep, it's still nighttime. Go back to sleep. And he says, no, it's not. It's daytime, it's time to wake up. And I say, go on to sleep. <laughs> it's dark outside. And he says, mommy, it's over for you. <laughs> He's talking about nighttime. But I took it like, my life. <laughs> so uh, I like to tell people uh, how much he weighed at birth, because I like when people respect me. Uh, <laughs> he was 10 pounds, he was 10 pounds. Yeah, that's right, you better recognize. You better recognize up in this. Bitch, peace, I don't know what he said. <laughs> Up in this piece, all right. I'll have to get that one. 10 pounds and um, my, I'm so sorry, that's my child. I'll be right back. <laughs> um, my cousin had a baby a week after me and uh, her baby, five pounds, totally healthy, everything was fine, but she called me to commiserate. Oh my God, I can, I can totally relate. <laughs> no, you can't. I could have had two of your babies. <laughs> two of your babies. Boom, boom, two. I could have had your baby, put it back in, flipped it around, and had it again. Get out of here with your five pound baby. <laughs> My baby could eat your baby. <laughs> My husband was there for all the action, right? All the, he's like, yeah. He got excited because the doctor said, do you want to help? And he started stretching like he was going for a long run. <laughs> doing neck rolls and he dove in like he lost keys in a big purse. All right. I know, what's happening? The chapstick I was looking for. 
And look, the, the men are supportive, you know, whatever partner you have, right? They love you. They, they're like, you're doing great. And he was breathing on me all up in my nose holes. <laughs> all in my face, I love you. <sighs> and I stopped everything. I stopped pushing a 10 pound baby out. And I looked up at him and I said, you get a mint. And I <laughs> How sad that my husband's breath hurts more than having a baby. <laughs> That's a sad moment for everybody involved. <laughs> when you get home from the hospital and you have this person and you're, right, you don't know. And I, you know, I wasn't allowed on the furniture. <laughs> I had a big baby, so I had to wear diapers. Yeah, that's right. I take you from respecting me to feeling sorry for me. Diapers, I was in diapers. Do you understand what that does psychologically when you're an adult person walking down the hallway of your house in diapers and you haven't slept in a month, just ah. And you don't eat anything, and none of this gets washed, and you're just a zombie, just ah. Like you were like in some sort of alien abduction. Nobody believes what you went through. Nobody. But you're like, and then the light, and then this thing came out. Rah, 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 rah. And they're like, right, right, that all happened, right. But I was in diapers, and all you do is you just want sleep. Like that first month, you haven't slept. You don't sleep for four weeks straight. And I'm just walking around in my hallway, right? Down my hallway, three in the morning, with no shirt on. Why? What's the point? Why? 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 I'm asking you, why? This is open 24-7. Why put a shirt on? Just boobs flapping from side to side. I'm in a diaper like a crackhead, just ah. I want to get some sleep. I don't know if this is how crackheads dance, but I'm going to assume. <laughs> Got to get some sleep. Ha, ha, ha. Next time you see a homeless woman in diapers out here on Santa Monica Boulevard, you don't judge her. She could have just had a baby and she's going out for some fresh air. <laughs> so I see my husband at the end of the hallway and he sees me and I'm like, ha, ha. I will give you a quickie for 20 minutes of sleep. <laughs> now, I don't know if any of the men in here have ever been serviced by a woman in a diaper. <laughs> Everybody is crying in that situation. <laughs> intro had, yeah, the Soviet Union. I know some of the young people have no idea. You don't know, you don't know. KGB, right, you don't, you're too young. Communist must get moose and squirrel. Any of this? <laughs> I was, that's where I was born, and uh, I realize now that I'm a parent, there's no way my parents loved me. <laughs> didn't do the stuff that I'm doing for this kid. Are you kidding me? We found out that my kid has a peanut allergy. Yeah, yeah. So I called my mom in a panic, right? I'm like, mom, I need to know back in Russia uh, when I was little, did I have any allergies? And she said, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> you, you, that's your job. <laughs> We don't pay attention to these things in Russia. <laughs> That's only this country. Allergy, allergy, allergy. If I wait in line seven hours for peanuts, you're going to eat these peanuts. <laughs> I'm 
so now I have an EpiPen with me everywhere I go in my purse, which is, by the way, a diaper bag. And my kid's out of diapers. I'm just lazy. <laughs> I need to get a regular chick purse. I don't know what my problem is, but I still walk around with this diaper bag. And that's exactly what it just looks like every time you... And I see these women with like cute little moo 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 moo, especially in Los Angeles. Everyone has like a little bubble bubble, like just right under their armpit. Moo bubble. Just a little purse, like it's holding lipstick for their nipple. And I go everywhere with a diaper bag. I went to a wedding. My kid wasn't even with me. I plopped it down on the table we were sitting, and these drunk 20-somethings were like, glug, 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 glug. Oh my God, is that your diaper bag? Oh. And I said, yeah, Drunky McDrunkerson, it is. And when you shit your pants later, who are you gonna come running to? That's right, diaper bag lady. You need me, I got everything backstage. I got wipes, I got lotions and potions. I got my EpiPen, peanuts for everyone tonight. Let's go crazy. I'm just trying to read books and, and just, you know, to just be a good parent. That's really all I want to do, because at three is when they start to throw insane, ridiculous, almost like, like mushroom-induced LSD tantrums, <laughs> where there's just like a lot of like writhing on the floor and like an electric guitar solo. <laughs> And it's always in the grocery store because I think at their baby meetings, they go, all right, you guys, before we leave, don't forget to lose your mind at Ralph's. Okay, good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> and trust me, look, when I'm shopping by myself and I see a kid having a tantrum, I mean, don't get me wrong, my favorite thing to do is to take my shopping cart right over there and just fold my arms and look that mother up and down. Get it together! <laughs> this is Whole Foods. You better take that shit to Vons. <laughs> I'm paying double for bananas. You better get it together. <laughs> but trust me, that is my kid every time we're shopping. Every time, we were in the checkout, right? And, uh, and he sees at the end of the checkout, uh, all the candy, right? Reese's peanut butter cups. All of a sudden, those are the ones he wants. I want those. No, you can't have those, all right? You're not allowed to have those. I want those! And now he's screaming. Everyone is staring, right? I hate the looks that people give, right? So I usually, in that situation, will lean in and speak to him in a lower satanic register of my voice. <laughs> You know, something like, you shut the fuck up. I swear to God, I'll kill you. Kids, ah! I swear to God, everybody is watching. Shut the fuck up. But I read in a book you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> There is a real book out there. It's called Happiest Toddler on the Block. And in this book, it says when your kid is screaming, yelling, and having a tantrum, you have to also scream and yell the same thing they're yelling at the same level. So now you have two people losing their minds. Okay, fine, I tried it, right? I tried it this one time. I said, you can't have those because they have peanuts. You're not allowed to have peanuts. But now he's screaming, but I want peanuts! which is a word that a three-year-old can't pronounce correctly. <laughs> so in reality, he's yelling, I want penis! <laughs> and now I have to yell, I know you want penis! Mommy wants penis too! We can't have penis, it makes our throats close up! <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. My name is Kira Sultanovich. Let's be mothers helping others, helping mothers, helping others. Kira Saltanovich, my God. That segment was awesome and it was so funny. I agree. I really thought it was 
money. My favorite part was when the ladies made jokes. Yeah, that was a really good part. As fun as it is to laugh at the more absurd aspects of parenting, it's very clear that both Kira and Danny are doing everything they can to raise happy, healthy, Peanut free children. <laughs> which brings us to this portion of the evening. This is a segment we call Save the Starfish, which is especially appropriate for our next guest because she uses the starfish story on her own website to make the point that we all have the power to do something. Mm -hmm. To recap the story, there was a young girl who was walking down the beach when she noticed that hundreds of starfish had washed up on the shore. So one by one, she picked them up and started throwing them back in. And then a man comes up to her and says, what are you doing? There's too many. You can't possibly make a difference. Why even bother? And the little girl picks up another starfish, throws it back in, and says, well, it made a difference to that one. What we want to emphasize with this story is that the little girl didn't look at the starfish and say, gee, if only I had a degree in marine biology, I could study the tidal patterns to discover what causes to happen and to prevent it from happening in the future. Maybe she should get that degree, and maybe she will, but at this moment, she's taking whatever action she can. She doesn't say, if only I could build a device that would allow me to scoop up all the starfish at once. Well, maybe she should build that device, and maybe she will, but right now, she's using the device that she has, her hands. And she's not railing about how her taxes go to pay for the EPA and the Department of Fish and Wildlife and to fund grants for Heal the Bay and how somebody from one of those places should really be here doing something about this. That would make her a little asshole. <laughs> because she's clearly too young to pay taxes. The point is, maybe, some of one, maybe one of those people should be there, but they're not. She is, and she's not waiting for somebody else to act. No, she's not. I mean, you can wait until the perfect moment in time when suddenly you have everything figured out, or, like the little girl, you can dig in with what you've got and just start throwing back some starfish. And in fact, our next guest is doing that in a big, big way. Take a look. My name is Raquel Turner and I am the founder of Mothers Fighting for Others and we run a home in Kenya uh, for girls called St. Monica's Children's Home. My first trip in 2007 to Kenya, I met 25 amazing girls. Anywhere between four years old and at that point probably 16. These 25 girls were true orphans because of you know, HIV or if it was because their parents had just died or a political issue that had happened and they had been murdered, they were brought to the home. The biggest thing that hit me was I was never alone. The girls were constantly on me, wanting to hold my hand, hug me, kiss me. They just wanted that closeness, that, that feeling of a touch, and especially from a mom. My goal every time I go is to hug them, to look at them, to really look at them and tell them that I love them. Because the stigma of being an orphan in general is hard enough for them to deal with. You're less than. You, obviously you've lost your parents and you don't have a home and you can tell the kids that are, are the have-nots, you know, the, the shoes that have huge holes in them, the socks that don't fit, the, the, the huge you know, holes in their sweaters, you can tell. The name Mothers Fighting for Others came about because I always figured, what would happen if I died? I mean, I've got six kids. That would be a lot of work for someone to take on. Mothers Fighting for Others is what we think that their mothers would have wanted for them. And we figured, got to have a great education and to make sure that they're loved and that they know that they're loved. The conditions at the home were painful to look at. They were in a, a building that was just an old hospital. No grass, not really cement. It was dirt with a lot of rocks around it. That's what I saw. I was worried. Things weren't wonderful at the old home. You know, the girls um, were not happy there. Not a place to laugh and play and just be kids. Mrs. Gotomi was on the board of directors. When we needed to move, she became my partner. Now we have you know, 33 girls to put through school and 33 girls to take care of. Simple things. 
like underwear, or just going to school. I mean, simple, simple things. If you don't get an education and you're a girl, life gets very difficult and you're most likely going to stay at home. And you're most likely going to have lots of children and you're most likely going to have other girls, daughters who don't go to school as well. And so we just know that by giving these girls an opportunity to go to school just to finish high school. And so that changes everybody's lives everybody's lives now multiply that by you know 34 44 children and we've changed a complete community Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rocky Turner. Oh. Hi. I'm really wishing I had that second <laughs> glass of wine next door. <laughs> So it's a lot easier to work for other people than it is to have people talk about you. So thank you for being here for us to be able to highlight all the good work that you do. Um, I really love the name of your organization because it, it's not just a name that sounds good. It describes exactly what you do. I mean, you were fighting for these girls. And we saw how it took two years to move them from the Dreher Hospital that they were in into this wonderful environment that you've now created for them. So could you please share with us a little bit more about how you've been fighting for the girls for the past six and a half years? I mean, it started within the first six months of me getting to know them, where we found out that the director, the original director of the home, was lying to us about how much things cost. And what we thought was $1,000 to send a girl that was really like 200. Mm -hmm. And so he was pocketing the money. And we found, luckily we found out very, very early. And at that point, he never got another penny. And so. Uh, what did you do instead? I had to travel there myself. And how did you travel there? <laughs> Uh, I traveled there sometimes alone with lots of cash on my body. There was a trip that I had, I had a money belt on and I had anywhere, but, well, one trip I had $10,000 strapped to my body. One, I haven't even told you this, I had about $24,000 strapped to my body. And we actually, at that trip, we ended up having to go to an IDP camp mm -hmm. and we were there for six hours and I, it was very difficult for me to have that amount of money for different people while I was there at a refugee camp. And you were taking that money and making sure that it went directly to? Oh, it was, a very, it was difficult because I couldn't give it to him. And at that point, we, sometimes we had four girls going to school. At the worst, we had 16 girls going to school and they were never going to the same school. So I would have to go to a bank, transfer money, then go to the school, pay for the school. And then we would have to buy all of the things for the children. So you have, a, you have kids, mm -hmm. so if you had to, send your child off to boarding school for three months. Imagine all the things you had to buy mm. for three months. Tell us what some of those things are. Well, they're all girls, so that makes it worse. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I mean, if we go from head to toe, I mean, you've got, you know, hair and no makeup, but, um, you know, toothpaste, toothbrush, bras, underwear. These uniforms. are for the girls that are going to high school? Yes. So, actually, maybe we should explain that um, education in Nairobi is free from kindergarten to eighth grade, but that term free is a little bit misleading. Can you tell us why? Well, it's, it's free if you can purchase a uniform, if you can buy pencils and a bag, you have to get your books. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, if you're making one to two dollars a day, but you have to spend an American dollars, a hundred dollars, that's really, really tough. Mm -hmm. 
And if, if, I mean, if you have one child versus you know, four, right. you're most likely going to pick the boys to go to school right. and not the girls. Um, and so what is high school like then? Or not high school, eighth, ninth grade on, so that they understand um, the boarding school aspect of it. Well, um, for us, um, the girls go off and they're gone for three months. And it's, it's year round, so they come home every three months. And that's when we get to go visit them, is during those months off. Um, but for us, our um, sponsorship is about $1,500, and that's for the entire year. And that will take care of um, their tuition to go to school, um, any kind of extra, they call it tuition, it's, it's um, the supplementary mm -hmm. um, things that we can do for them if they're not doing well in math. Um, from book bags to their books, to, I mean everything that you, we all go to Walmart to get for our <laughs> own kids, yeah, there. that's what they need. And you partnered with Mrs. Gatomi, mm -hmm. Um, and she's been a wonderful partner. Can you tell us why she's been such a wonderful partner for you? Well, the first, the first time we met, we just clicked. And we met um, by happenstance. Actually, it was kind of a secret. Um, See, tell me this. Stories you don't know. <laughs> and uh, because the director didn't want us to meet. Mm. And I think now I understand why he didn't want us to meet. And when we met, we clicked instantaneously. And I found out she was a mother of seven. Mm -hmm. And we just sort of talked about what our dream and hope was for the girls. And after an hour and a half conversation, we knew that both our vision and what we wanted, the values that we had to, you know, to where we wanted the girls to be and what kind of women we wanted them to be, they just clicked. And we haven't stopped. And Mrs. Gatomi also know, knows from firsthand experience what it's like to fight for her own education. <laughs> Could you please share that story with Well, she, first of all, she's got, I don't know, like, I can't keep count, like 14, 15 brothers and sisters. And so she was one of the, um, she's one of the older ones, but even her younger brothers got to go to school mm -hmm. and she wasn't allowed to. And so she would actually sneak into her brother's homework and do the homework for them and the principal found out and asked to see her and she thought she was in trouble. And the principal ended up sponsoring her and she got to go to school. Yeah, okay. It was really cool. Um, so, so she knows more than she anybody. Knows. I mean, she, <laughs> she's, she's it. Um, also, for everyone here to know, Mothers Fighting for Others is a 100% volunteer organization. Mm -hmm. All the money raised goes straight to the girls. You've already told us a little bit about what that is like. Um, but people do go and volunteer there and spend their time. Can you tell us what that part of it is like? Well, you got to pay for your own ticket mm -hmm. since it's all volunteer. Um, and they go for a week, two weeks? It matters what you can do. I mean, we are a, well, we want to go when the children are there. So normally we go in April, August, um, or December. Those are the times that we get to go because we want to spend the most time, you know, we can with them. And we just kind of hang out. I mean, we, it really comes down, I mean, now we get to just hang out. You we say now, hey, there's pictures of people painting. Yeah, <laughs> the, when we first lived in the home, I mean, yeah. I feel really bad. We've got, um, you know, two board members, Jen and Ashley, who were there uh, when we, the second trip that we had to, you know, do that to the house. And, uh, I mean, they retiled bathrooms. And, I mean, it was, we had some, we had a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, even though it's a, it's a night, it's a house. They, they went from a, from a, old hospital setting to an actual house it was just really it, it was it was really bad. <laughs> it was really bad you wouldn't want to pee in that bathroom <laughs> so um one of the other things i wanted to, that you mentioned in the video obviously is how an education can change the life of a girl and change the whole community as a result mm -hmm. but the community at saint monica's children's home in nairobi has been very supportive of you guys absolutely um because now uh the home you've grown to how many girls we have 44 children. We do have we do have um, three boys. Three boys, and so now you're kind of busting at the seams. So what did the community do for you guys? Well, we knew that this house wasn't going to be able to hold us. I mean, first of all, it's we're renting it, mm. and the landlord is, you know, every month he's like, when are you going to leave? When are you going to leave? And so Mrs. Gatomi took it upon herself to purchase 20 acres of land. I mean, she out of the out of her own bank account and wow. took her own loan out and that kind of. I mean, she's dedicated. And her whole family is dedicated to it, and uh, she's put on her own her own fundraisers there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Kenning community um, have helped literally raise the building, mm -hmm. so we're on the second floor of the building now. Um, but that's just that portion of it. I mean, you know, we have times when even though we do send money, it's just simply not enough. And so the community comes around, and you know, you got 90 kilos of rice, and now we've 
we can feed the girls for you know a month or two. I mean, it's it's big from from clothes to food. But the coolest thing about Mrs. Gatomi is if you can't, if you can't give something, then spend time. Mm -hmm. Because a, not a lot of visitors might come, you know, family members might not be able to come and just speak to the girls, you know, be, be advocates for them, um, especially young, educated women are always welcome to the house because they're role models for our girls. So it's really cool. Well, Rocky, it's been such a pleasure getting to know you and meeting you, and we wish you and the girls many, many more victories on your journey. Thank you so much. Let's hear it for Rocky Turner. <laughs> segment is called the game, the game is rigged for the girls that mothers fighting for other serves it can feel like the game is rigged against them because it is now as you've seen Rocky is doing her part to help unrig the game for them but we thought it would also be fun to invite someone else on who can help her unrig it even more you may know tonight's contestant from wait wait don't tell me or his TED talk or because he held up the line in front of you at airport security <laughs> his uh, Showtime special, I Come in Peace, is now available on iTunes and Netflix streaming. He has toured the world performing stand-up comedy and received accolades from such obscure figures as Queen Raina of Jordan and some dude named Barack Obama. It is <laughs> our very great pleasure to welcome to the stage Mr. Maz Jobrani. <laughs> Welcome. Wow, that's thank you. Yes, that's very. It uh, really sucks you in, so that you're stuck with us for a while. Yeah, not a lot of springs in this thing. Well, <laughs> that's like that's like a just the best for you. That's like a taxi in Beirut. <laughs> it is. Oh. Um, thank you so much for being here. I know you normally would be spending this time with your family, so we really appreciate you coming and subjecting yourself to our very hard hitting. Questions I know. I'm excited. You. Thank you for having me. And uh, this is cool. It's funny. And then and, and you got a cause, and you got an audience. And hi, audience. Wow. Those are all, uh, hi. And a band. <laughs> yes. Those are all the elements and we need. Camera. And this guy. You've got him. You're working hard. Yeah. <laughs> Take it easy, buddy. <laughs> all right. Uh, you were actually a huge inspiration to us when we were planning this show, and your name came up a lot because we are trying to use comedy to sort of redirect the conversation about women, mm -hmm. and you have very successfully used comedy to change the conversation about Middle Easterners in the oh. Middle East. I thought you were saying about women. <laughs> we know you don't care for women. Yes, so no, no. no. We Middle East. Have, we Middle wouldn't East. have we talked have. about that. No. This is women? Forget it. I'm out of here. <laughs> you, you belong at the house. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no. Right, so the point is you dispel stereotypes, is what we're saying. That's the goal, Well yes. done, yes. good job. Yes. Uh, do you think you might be our best chance for world peace at this time? I am trying. Um, <laughs> Have you been invited to Geneva at all recently? Well, Iran, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I was born in Iran and grew up here. Mm -hmm. And so I could probably help there. But now you got this Ukraine thing. I can't help. I don't speak uh, Ukrainian. We'll Russian? have to put Kira <laughs> on that. Know. That yeah, will be Kira. her job. Um, in the early 2000s, you were part of the Axis of Evil comedy tour. Yes. Which the name itself tells you about where ideas on the Middle East were at mm -hmm, the time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, how have you seen audience reactions change to you and the things you talk about over the last decade? Or have you? Um, they still hate me. <laughs> and uh, no, no, no. Clearly. No, the audience is great. They've always been, it's been fun. I think a lot of people, uh, we don't give credit to people for, uh, for, for how much people know. A lot of people do know a lot. And so it was great when we did the Access of Evil comedy tour. Um, it was me and three other Middle Eastern Americans, and we would do stand-up, and the audiences were great, and they were totally in the know. And um, 
and, and what was what was good also was that uh, we never tried going into like we didn't go into like enemy territory necessarily like you know we didn't do like, like a Fox Spence sponsored show. Sean had an apron. Sean had an apron. Good not. friends of mine slash uh, suspects are. <laughs> profile tonight so we never did that but but we had a chance to tour all over the world and perform and a lot of people uh, get it and I think uh, and the other thing you realize is that comedy does it translates pretty well you know and um, and so uh, no it's been good and now I do material about my kids as well mm -hmm. so I was watching uh, the ladies earlier and I know the girls and they uh, they it's funny stuff so kids give you stuff we can all we can all come together and hate kids <laughs> yeah no, I mean it's a very Common cause. They really? do. They're yeah, because they're high pitched, they you are. know, and that they tends are. to really help. I think that's where it's at, right there. Yeah. 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 Uh, I saw an interview you did where you talked about how when you were a kid and you would do shows, you would play everything from Lil Abner to Batman, and then when you moved to Hollywood, you would only get auditions for Terrorist Number Three with a turban. Yeah. 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 Uh, I bring that up primarily to see if you are still interested in playing Batman because we could start a campaign for that tonight. Hashtag Batmaz. I think you would rock the bat suit. <laughs> Batmaz, I'm into it. I feel like, I mean, America was not kind to of Ben Affleck, so they might be totally ready for something different. Why not? Let's do this. No, I, it's, 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 well, that's what got me interested in acting was as a kid when you would do plays, you could play everything. And then you come to Hollywood and then they go, can you say, I will kill you in the name of Allah? Yeah. And, you know, I you could. Surprisingly good at that, Mas. Thank you. I will kill you in the name of Allah. Alarmingly. You know, Allah. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Uh, jokes like these got you invited to the White House, not by the Axis of Evil president, but the one after that. Yes. Um, what was Michelle like? Because she seems amazing. Well, you know, Michelle and I, uh, we had a conversation. No, what I got invited, you, a lot of people, it was, this, it was this holiday party, and a bunch of people got invited, and you think you're special. I didn't get invited. Well, you guys didn't. I, I was <laughs> not invited. But other and bunch I of think people. Michelle's amazing. Well, you totally should have come. And, and, <laughs> And what you do though is you go there and you think, oh, well, this is what is this a sit down with us? You know, my wife, me, me, my wife, you know, and Michelle and Barack, it's gonna be great. Mm -hmm. And then you go there and there's no, there's a bunch of people. You go in and then they hand you this card with a time on it. And you're like, what's this? And they go, that's when you get to take your picture with the president. And that's literally, I had like three seconds. Here's your card. Exactly, that's the card. <laughs> and you have three seconds and, you go, and they line you up and you go all the way around. They're very nice. Everyone, when I when I said I was going to this Christmas party, everyone had a message. Like, <laughs> I'm serious. Like my, I have, I, I have a, my Republican friend was like, tell him not to raise taxes. <laughs> I like that that uh, was singular, by one, the way. There's one, there's one guy. Uh, my Republican friend. My Democrat friends all, uh, they, uh, they said, give him a hug. Uh, and my mom said, tell him I love him. Um, and that was the only message that got out. I said, my mom loves you. Oh, thank you. Tell your mother Aww. I love you. And then I said, how do you know my mother? And um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but what was interesting actually was when we take the picture, they put us, like they separated us, so it's, you know, it's, I think it's, it's, you know, he's, no, actually we're in the middle and they're on the sides, and we walked away, you get one shot, you know, everyone, the, the camera's there, you go and you do this, and, huh, and, and I was like, I'm not going to blow it, I'm ready to go. As we're walking away, my wife's like, I think I blinked. I go, what do you mean? She goes, he grabbed me. I go, what? <laughs> He grabbed you? She goes, yeah. I go, how dare he grab you and not me? He should have grabbed me. I got the invite. So, but Michelle grabbed you with her guns. She yeah, put her yeah. guns around she's, you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good looking people. Good looking. You, yeah, good looking. Very yeah. nice. Yeah. Yes, yes, very nice. Um, <laughs> you recorded your stand up special, I Come in Peace, in Sweden. Yes. Is that because Maz Jobrani is to Sweden what David Hasselhoff is to Germany? Yes, definitely. <laughs> I am. They call me the Night Rider in Sweden. <laughs> Why Sweden? For very different reasons. I, <laughs> I only, I only come out at night, and I, I just ride. In the a, land of the eternal sunshine. In the land of eternal sunshine, <laughs> and I ride my skateboard around town. They go, "There's the Night Rider." And, <laughs> And, uh, this took a very odd turn. That's really why. That's it. And it's actually a German accent. It's a German guy. It's a German guy living in Sweden who thinks I'm David Hasselhoff, and he's very confused. There he is. Where is Kurt? And, um, I should 
Chairman kind of, Guy with yeah, this, this is a very complicated story. No, I filmed it there because uh, I was going there to do shows. They're actually big comedy fans because this is what I learned afterwards. Um, uh, the Nordic countries, when they see Western film and television, they see it in English with subtitles. So mm -hmm. they speak English very well. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you go to like, like France and Spain and some of that, Italy, they, some people speak it well, but, but a lot of times uh, they dub it. So, you know, you, they're not going to get it, you know. <laughs> What's it? It's not right, not right. What is that? You know? uh, I don't understand. It's not good. Um, <laughs> Life is not so beautiful. That's a 15-year-old <laughs> reference right there. Uh, he's a no Roberto um, Benigni. He's like not climbing proving. on the chairs. Um, <laughs> these are all people that, okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> But it hadn't come out in Sweden yet, yeah, yeah. is the thing. So. For, for those of you who weren't born then, you could like... You know, you <laughs> what? Anyway, anyway um, yeah, I did it. It was in Sweden. It was cool. And here's, this is a cool thing that happened. Uh, usually in my shows, uh, I, it's cool. I get a mixed crowd and I talk to the crowd, who's from here, who's from there, etc. And usually if there's like a Jewish person in the audience, I go, are there any Palestinians? And then I have them wave. And then say hello to each other. You are. Peace, I'm totally trying. Um, but this is. But what happened was, and usually they're not, you know, like ones here and ones there. And in Sweden, uh, they were seated next to each other. And I was like, only in <laughs> Stockholm, where the Nobel Peace Prize is given, where a Jew and an, and an Arab would sit next to each other. And, we and, have and then here. they And then they fought. Exactly. <laughs> we, have, we have a Jew and oh, an Iranian oh, yes. right Wait, next I'll to each other. You, my brother. I'm telling yes. you, Peace. get us to Geneva. I'm saying. Thank you so much. You know the president. We can make this happen, Let's Maz. make it happen. Um, we're, it's our work beyond is done. helping children. We're world peace is our new goal. Well, yeah, yeah. That's, we're speaking that's when small. You know, yeah, that's when you know the show's not quite defined yet. <laughs> Every show we just kept changing our thing. Midway yeah. through, depending yeah. on what we thought we could accomplish. Yeah. Um, on a more serious note, yes. so we have been... Speaking tonight about people going to great lengths for children that they care about, and I imagine that's something you can relate to because your parents immigrated here during mm -hmm. a time of political upheaval, which yes. could not have been easy. The revolution of 1979, yes, of Correct. Iran. And now you have two children yeah. of your own. Was, there might have been another revolution. <laughs> I don't want to upset somebody, you know, some guy in the back. Algeria had one too. My parents heard about it. They were very upset. <laughs> they were like, Let's I would never to go to that show again. They insulted the revolution of 79 in Algeria. Um, <laughs> gone off the rails. Uh, <laughs> but given your family history and that you do have two children of your yes. own now, do you sort of feel an extra responsibility to make sure they understand the advantages they have and what it took for them to be able to have yeah, a father who's I'm, going to bring about world peace? Well, I mean, there's still, there's five-year-old, there's three and five. No, so they but they understand, Yeah, right? they kind of are. <laughs> I sit them down every day. I sit them down. I show them. Uh, you uh, do Iranian Revolution puppet shows. Show, <laughs> uh, here's the Khomeini. And, uh, <laughs> And here's the show, and he's chasing him out, and he's, and he's going to America. And then there's the hostages. I totally should do that. <laughs> the finger puppets for each of the hostages. That's the best idea I've heard in a long time. I'm going to start that every Friday night at this theater. <laughs> Fantastic. The Revolution Puppet Show. It's great. I love it. Um, all right, well. <laughs> so our, your so, show just changed so, again. Someday, do you feel like you might? No, I try. I actually, I was actually asking Rocky about this earlier because what she does, I asked her, I said, well, you know, you have kids. I go, when did you teach them to appreciate and, and volunteer? And she said, you know, they, they're obviously immersed in it. And so I try, I've tried. The, the closest I've come so far, uh, the five-year-old, I told him, I tell him about appreciating things. I say, you got to appreciate stuff. I guess, you, you know, you have things, but some people don't have things. And, uh, and then I, I told them, you know, you know, sometimes you see homeless people, give money and stuff. And it was actually very sweet one time because we live across the street from a 7-Eleven and I was walking with the two of them to go, I don't know what I was getting, a Kit Kat or something. Um, and as we were approaching, he said, Daddy, do you, have, do, you have a, do you have a dollar? And I was like, and I forgot about it. And I was like, sure. And he goes, can I have it? I go, sure. And, he, and I gave it to him. He walked over and gave it to the homeless guy. And I was That's like, well, nice. that is really nice. You know how to give daddy's money away. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah. but I'm hoping it sinks in. I really want them to appreciate it, especially that we live in L.A. 
and the privileged life that mm -hmm. we live. I mean, I honestly, I, I've thought about this. Uh, I think that one of the biggest thing, one of my biggest pet peeves is when teenagers complain in America. And I think there should be a study abroad program where mm -hmm. every kid has to go live somewhere else and mm -hmm. see how, and there, what would be great actually, thank you, you can clap one person. <laughs> <laughs> I Who think, is starting a study abroad How about program? a law that when a teenager complains in America, you can drive them to the airport, they gotta go live in a third world country for a year, <laughs> and then come back and complain, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That'd be, right? Like, yeah. have them actually go play with like real angry birds, like for a year. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Actual angry birds. Actual angry birds. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, well, I tell you this all the time, but I will say it for the benefit of our audience. You are not only one of the most kind and generous people I've ever met, you are also the hardest working, and you deserve every bit of success you have had. We wish you nothing but more success with everything Thank you, you do going forward. Thank you. Except for this game. Oh, okay. You bring me down. Yeah. <laughs> Except for the game you're about to play, because it's rigged. See, now he's zooming in. So, Look, he's finally working. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to play The, the Game is Rigged! When you answer, I go ahead and grin. Just keep in mind that you won't win. But lose it should never cause you shame. Because you know we break the game. <clears throat> so... Maz, you understand that the game you're about to play is rigged, correct? I understand, Your Honor, yes. Okay. Try, try, try as you may, and we really do want you to try, no matter what, you're gonna lose it. Is well, that clear? I think I can win this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I like that you Perfect, think. so knowing that no matter what you wager, you are going to lose, how much are you willing to wager that you can win this game? I'm gonna bet $100. Woo! Woo! Good, no, fantastic. All right, this game is called You've Got Umlaut of Nerve. <coughs> did, did you say umt? Umlaut. Like, umlaut. like the dots. Because oh. you recorded your stand up special in Sweden. Oh, well, and you use oh. comedy to dispel stereotypes. Mm. So we've created a game about stereotypes about Sweden. Oh. See what we did there? Wow. Okay. And they have a lot of umlauts, umlauts. on their words. So umlaut of nerve. Okay, umlaut. we're going to read you six rhymes, and you fill in the word or words that belong at the end of each. For sure. example, if I said, these 70s singers were the darlings of pop, with songs like Dancing Queen, No One Could Stop, sung by everyone, even Yo Gabba Gabba, this Swedish foursome is best known as... Abba. Very good. Well done. Well done. I feel like you guys are hustling me right now. <laughs> okay. That is so easy. It is called The Game is Sick. Right. Yeah. All right, here we go. Each missing word or phrase is something that comes to mind when you think of Sweden, or when we do. Mm -hmm. And the first two lines are a clue, and the third line might be a clue, or it might just be words that rhyme with the answer, because not a lot of Swedish phrases are particularly Susian. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Ready? Here we go. Okay. okay. Pronounced in Sweden, Shatbular. Ooh. What? What just Ooh. happened? I don't, I don't know, know, but I hear something. We're being we attacked by is the that Swedish. Me? Is that me? Are we okay? Here, let's They're try like, that. Oh, we don't rhyme? We were sure. <laughs> <you>. <laughs> what is going on? Pronounced in Sweden, Shatbular. Don't drop one or it may roll far. It just doesn't want me to say this. Um, they're tiny, tasty little heat stalls. We speak, of course, of Swedish. Meatballs! Yeah. Yay! Okay, that was oh. worth one point. Very good. Oh, how many do I have to get? 300. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> my varums by my Billy Benno, but just where should my Inga Torp go? Extra dowel, you know I see ya, when I buy prefab from... Ikea! Yay! <laughs> That was worth 10 points. Wow. So coming along nicely. Oh my goodness. You're up to 11. Uh, my chalk isn't working. There we go. 11. Oh, 11. Thank you. That Your was math working. isn't working. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try this little one. All right, nice. that'll just have to do. Right. There we go. <laughs> Murder, leather, chains, and whips. Sexual obsession and Australian trips. A cinematic pearl Mr. Sagan sat through. Stieg Larsson's what? Mm. Pearl Murder. Mr. Sagan sat through. Stieg Larsson's. Stieg Larsson's. Uh, I'm a Does woman, but if I was it? younger. 
The girl oh, with the dragon. Oh, yeah. I didn't see it. I didn't see yeah, it. Yeah, that right. was worth 20, so now oh. you're at minus nine. Oh. It's not... It's not looking good for you at this uh, time. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> to quote him, Flurg and Durg and Dork, Erg de Schmerg de Bork, Bork, Bork. <laughs> it's a quote. <clears throat> Neither doctor nor lawyer nor fireman nor ref. He's the Muppets' top cook. He's the famed... Swedish chef. Yay! Very good. That was worth half a point because he's not really Swedish. He's a Muppet. He's a Muppet. Wow. The hostage's plight ties that bind Patty Hearst. Defending your jailers is truly the worst. Stranger than fiction or a rock gnome's chin foam, it's a condition known as the Stockholm Syndrome. Woo! Well done! That was worth 8.5 points. So this is for all of it. Here we go. <laughs> Diplomat, economist, Nobel Prize winner. Get this one correct and we'll all buy you dinner. Big in the 50s, he could snog, slam, or scold. UN Secretary General. Don't say it! <laughs> UN Secretary General, wait. The mm -hmm. person in the audience who knows it, stand up and say it out loud. Wait, yeah. give Maz a Everybody chance. Do yeah. No, I wouldn't, I, would, I wouldn't get it, that was nice. That was worth 300 points. You could have won, but you did not. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Dog Hammarskjöld. Dog Hammarskjöld. Everyone thinks of him when they think of Sweden, correct? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Maz. I'm afraid you did not win, and you will be donating your $100. But you should not feel bad because, after all, the game, the game was rigged. Yes. Well, thank you, guys. Lost the game, you'll pay the price. The losing <laughs> never felt so nice. Your reputation, there's no stain because your loss is. Mother's fighting for others. Yay! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for Maz Joe Brani! That's it, everybody. That's our show. One more round for Kira Saltanovic. Thank you to Danny Fine Monaset, Maz Joe Brani, and Rocky Turner. Uh, come back next time when our guests will be Alex Alexander, Jody Miller, and Gary Anthony Williams. And we'll be yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> And we'll be raising funds for Right Girl, a wonderful organization that's here in Los Angeles. So we'll see you then. Thanks everybody. Bye -bye. Good night. Thank you. The show was totally awesome. Yes, I agree. It was awesome. I can't wait for next month's show. I'ma tell all my friends to go, 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 go. I'ma tell all my friends to go, 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 go.